when it comes to the uh, mustache march. Um, he, it wasn't just in March. When he was a, uh, a wing commander during the Vietnam War, um, his base was largely responsible for uh, flying uh, MiG combat air patrols. So send fighters up, go intercept uh, enemy MiGs. Um, he, uh, his defiance was like, you know, he didn't like how politicians and senior leaders in Washington were kind of controlling the war from Washington. So his way of defying them was growing a, a mustache that was out of regulations. Um, hence you saw it there, it was really bushy and he, he actually waxed it, stuff like that. Um, really kind of a kind of a cool dude. He uh, obviously aced, I think this is 12 or 13 uh, victories in World War II. Um, did not fight in Korea, uh, but was a wing commander pilot, fighter pilot in, in uh, Vietnam. Uh, was only really credited with like two kills, but he basically came back from a lot of missions saying, "Oh no, no, I didn't shoot shoot anybody down." Uh, the rumor has that he shot down a number of aircraft. He was worried that had he been credited with all the air-to-air -air victories he he'd had, that they were going to pull him back from uh, from being a wing commander, um, kind of bring him back home as a hero and give him a staff staff job, anything, something like that. So he wanted uh, he wanted to stay out in the uh, in the fight with his guys. So. Kind of just kept a couple of those kills hush hush. And then around his base, everybody else started growing goofy mustaches too. Kind of caught on. But after he returned home from the war, he he was ordered to shave it, and he, he shaved it. So. All right, so we are so far along in Vietnam, we're almost done. So last week we finished talking about how. You know, after the war, Americans were very reluctant to uh, dedicate American boys and girls to fighting foreign wars. Uh, also led to uh, the War Powers Resolution Act uh, in October 1973, which, uh, theory at least, would restrict the president's ability to commit U.S. forces without congressional approval. Some uh, results for uh, for Vietnam. Obviously, Vietnam became one country. After U.S. withdrawal, 1975, North Vietnam invaded South. We did not respond with military force. We did respond basically with humanitarian efforts to help get uh, many of our political allies out of the South to uh, avoid persecution by the North. Saigon, which was the former South Vietnamese capital, anybody know what it was renamed to? <coughs> right there, very good favorites for social security. <coughs> Uh, <laughs> tens of thousands of Vietnamese, South Vietnamese citizens literally just hopped into boats and pushed out to sea. They were really boat people. Uh, many ultimately made their way to the United States. Uh, many of the U.S. supporters who did not get out were sent to uh, re-education camps, um, basically to, in essence, uh, indoctrinate them to the ways of communism. When all was said and done, there were over 6 million uh, displaced Vietnamese war refugees that either went to uh, other countries, uh, were boat people in the United States, or went elsewhere in the world. Uh, <clears throat> however, within the Viet Vietnamese borders, um, really kind of peace did eventually ensue. There was not an expected bloodbath where millions and millions of South Vietnamese were killed by communist war. Cambodia was another story in the 1970s, but we're not going to really uh, talk about that in this class. Any questions so far? Now we talked about this a few weeks ago. Everybody good? 
skip to the next slide. Yeah. So just some uh, lessons learned from the United States. Obviously, these are lessons learned. You know, whether or not we implement these in future wars, that's up to uh, up to leadership. But um, first and foremost, the United States alone cannot win a counterinsurgency war in another country. Only the government and people in that country can do so. Uh, so obviously, you know, with all the military might we had, we still weren't able to win uh, the counterinsurgency in Vietnam. We were not able to stop the Viet Cong. Really, it has to be a legitimate government in the country uh, to do that themselves. We kind of see that in Iraq today. Um, really seen that in Iraq really since about 2011. You know, when we handed the war over to them, saying this is your war now. You know, you have to win your own peace. Establish your own legitimate government. Uh, second bullet there, talking about a people's war. You know, force and technology are of good value. Um, I, think, I think that kind of reigns true in a lot of uh, a lot of conflicts throughout the world. Uh, you know, if you have a, a very determined enemy, you know, they will find a way to to beat technology. Uh, so you saw it in the in the video a couple weeks back. You know, when we're dropping those sensors in the jungle to track Vietnamese movements, how did they respond? They would drive a truck back and forth to us it, so they think there was a bunch of stuff there. Okay, so that's kind of one example of how the Vietnamese kind of overcame technology. Um, you know, even even when they expelled the uh, the French out in the 1950s, you know, basically reconnaissance <laughs> could see them reconnaissance could see them moving trucks and trains and boats, but what they couldn't see was you know, the, uh, the Viet Minh, the predecessors to the Viet Cong, you know, taking apart large guns, um, artillery pieces, carrying it on mules and on their own backs, on bicycles, you know, through the jungles. Um, you know, that's kind of how dedicated these, uh, these people were. Uh, furthermore, national leaders must base uh, their decision to commit forces to war on realistic assessments. Um, and I think this kind of ties into... You know, you got to have an end state you're trying to achieve. You know, in uh, in Vietnam, we were fighting on our side what we would consider a very limited war. We were just trying to prevent the fall of South Vietnam. Um, where you know, I don't think our uh, our nation's leadership really made a realistic assessment. You know, well, what is that going to take? How many people is that going to take? How aggressive are we going to have to be with uh, with our enemy? You know, because um, as we saw, really until 1972. With uh, linebacker one and linebacker two, we weren't even close to uh, stopping the enemy at all. Okay, obviously you got to know your enemy, know yourself, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. Um, but uh, <clears throat> furthermore, you got to know the American public as well. So obviously, modern wars more uh, open to public scrutiny. So you know, really, uh, the Tet Offensive 1968. Remember, that's where all the Viet Cong were rising up in South Vietnamese cities. That was kind of really the turning point of the war on the American home front. That's where uh, Walter Cronkite, a legitimate sort of Brian Williams of the day. I can't use Brian Williams anymore. This, this, this is terrible. Brian Williams used to be two guy. Anyways, um, he was like the uh, the nightly news guy that everybody <coughs> trusted. He was kind of the one who said, you know, what are we doing here in Vietnam? Uh, I don't think this war should be won after that Tet Offensive. So, again... Very televised, uh, and we kind of see that nowadays today. Um, so, and um, we all, again, we kind of learned the lesson, you know, let those who know war run the war. Let the military run the war. Um, don't, you know, don't let civilians without military experience, you know, make all those critical decisions as to what bombs, on what target, at what time, from what base we were attacking, um, things like that. Graduated response, is that effective or is it not effective? Not effective, very good. We'll see that uh, in examples uh, today. And then uh, lastly, just kind of talking uh, precision munitions. So we kind of saw the need for moving, uh, you know, having several uh, aircraft uh, attacking multiple targets. To, uh, we just kind of saw the need for technology to just have one aircraft, you know, in theory that could attack multiple uh, targets at the same time. And we'll see that in a video. <laughs> <coming up. coughs> and it's 
far as uh, revolutionary, not evolutionary technology, you know, <laughs> what kind of way we refer to with that is you know, we need those weapons for that next war. We don't, rather than just adapting kind of the, the weapon systems we have. So, <clears throat> kind of saw that with some of the, the fighter aircraft, bomber aircraft in, uh, in Vietnam. Yes, they very much got the job done, but again, we weren't using aircraft maybe for their designated purpose. Yes, they worked very well. But we kind of see in the 70s uh, with the development of further aircraft that, you know, designing aircraft for specific mission sets is a lot more effective than kind of adapting those aircraft to those mission sets. So, classic example, the F-4 Phantom. Remember, originally, fighter aircraft didn't have a gun originally. Um, kind of Any questions? Lessons learned? All pretty straightforward. Um, next, we're going to watch a video then on some of the weapon systems developed after the war, uh, and then we'll go through those uh, relatively quickly, quickly, then talk about a couple of conflicts uh, the United States uh, found itself in in the 1980s. <laughs> In the years after the Vietnam War, there was a surge in the development of totally new designs and the modernization of older ones. These developments were driven by two factors. One was the deficiency in USAF aircraft and missiles that had been revealed by the Vietnam War. The other was the impressive series of new planes being produced by the Soviet Union. Among them was the MiG-25. Even before the Vietnam War had ended, the Air Force was anxious to create its own designs. It was embarrassed that two of its most recent procurements, the McDonnell Douglas F-4 and the Bork A-7, had originally been designed and built for the Navy. In the previous decade, the procurement climate had changed drastically. <coughs> Costs had increased. The procurement process was intensely scrutinized by Congress, the media, and the public. Under Secretary of Defense McNamara's total procurement package, there was no fly-off competition. The airplane you bought from on-paper submissions is the airplane you got. This cumbersome procurement process caused development costs to balloon to as much as $3 billion. It was used for the last time. <coughs> to become the standard USAF air superiority fighter, the F-15. A new fighter had been needed since the mid-1960s. There was a year-long paper competition between North American Rockwell, Fairchild Hiller, and McDonnell <coughs> Douglas. McDonnell Douglas won. Their design became the F-15 Eagle. It was a design that responded to all the lessons learned so painfully in Vietnam. I set this big eagle, and may you reign supreme in your domain. Yeah, yeah. The Air Force came out of the war and saw the exactly mm -hmm. what it wanted in an air superiority fighter. First and foremost was maneuverability. McDonnell Douglas obtained that from the F-15 with large wings and relatively low weight. It wanted speed, and this was provided by two huge 25,000-pound thrust engines fed through these cavernous intakes behind me. This power provided a great rate of climb. In this particular aircraft, the Streak Eagle, set eight time to climb records, the last of which was to more than 98,000 feet in less than three and a half minutes. The F-15 pilot has superb 360-degree visibility to the huge cockpit canopy. The Eagle took full advantage of the electronic revolution. It was designed to work closely with AWACS aircraft. It has the latest in pulse Doppler radar, inertial navigation, and heads-up display for instrumentation. The F-15 first flew on July 27, 1972. Okay. 
unlike the F-40. It does not use long trails of exhaust smoke to give its position. It became operational with the 58th Tactical Fighter Wing on November 13, 1974. Even as the expensive F-15 was in development, there was pressure within the Pentagon for a lower-cost alternative fighter. The Fighter Underground is a small, independent group of Pentagon-based Air Force officers dedicated to the concept of a lightweight fighter. At first, their efforts were rebuffed as an intrusion on acquisition of the F-15. The procurement pendulum had swung, returning to the fly before by concept that had served so well for so many years. The lightweight fighter, the underground promoter, was perfect for seeing if fly before by still worked. In the lightweight fighter competition, the General Dynamics YF 16 won over the Northrop YF 17. By this time, the F-16 had overcome opposition within the Air Force staff. It was seen as a swing force fighter, meaning that it would be able to perform air-to-ground mission as well as its originally intended air-to-air -air mode. The F-16 was selected as a standard fighter for Belgium, <coughs> Denmark, Norway, and the Netherlands. <coughs> it became the largest international military co-construction in history. It made its combat debut with Israel in the famous strike against the Asarak nuclear reactor near Baghdad, Iraq. The round trip distance of 1,200 miles for that attack was accomplished without refueling. Later, the F-16 was used in combination with the F-15 with devastating effect of Israel's invasion of Lebanon in June of 1982. Syrian fighters and five helicopters were shot down without any Israeli losses. It was an incredible victory ratio, a tribute to both the Eagle and the Fighting Falcon. Can I get more water, please? Yeah, you bet. Press forward. Um, if we got time at the end, I'll run and get. I have it on a, a CD as well that we can try. If not, we got all the good stuff with the uh, F-15, F-16 um, on the front end there. But um, basically, like I kind of talked about earlier, the Air Force kind of throughout the Vietnam War was kind of seeing some holes, uh, basically in, in, its, in its capability. Um, you know, the F-4, which we used uh, extensively in the Vietnam War, was actually an aircraft originally designed for the Navy um, that we had kind of just said, okay, we can use that too. Um, and then we saw, really saw the need for uh, a better air to air superiority fighter, uh, which kind of led to the uh, initial acquisition of the F-15 Eagle. <coughs> F-15 
Team Eagle, obviously, uh, primarily an air-to-air -air aircraft. Uh, we did outfit some later uh, as F-15 Strike Eagles with uh, some air-to-ground capability. But uh, obviously, kind of a bigger aircraft, more expensive. Um, couldn't fulfill all of our uh, all of our needs with that just because of price, um, as well as uh, not extensive air-to-ground capability. So that's why we also uh, acquired the F-16 Falcon. Uh, both of which still in uh, extensive use today. Uh, F-15 pretty much getting phased out though. Um, some guard units still flying them, uh, but with the exception of the ones outfitted for air to ground, uh, not using that as much. Both uh, impeccable uh, <coughs> combat uh, records. You saw the, the uh, example uh, by the Israelis, um, but essentially uh, F-15 has never been never been shot. With our uh, extensive role in supporting ground forces in the Vietnam War, we also saw the need for an uncomplicated, easy to maintain, close air support weapon. So we acquired the A-10 Thunderbolt II, which, anybody know which picture that is? <coughs> okay, very good. It's like they're in order, F-15, F-16, A-10. So. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, A-10 Thunderbolt, affectionately known the, as the Warthog, could operate from forward bases carrying up to 16,000 pounds of ordnance and fe featured a 30 millimeter uh, GAU-8 tank killing cannon. So that, uh, that huge bullet that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas brought in last week, that's from the A-10. Um, and they, uh, <clears throat> they basically could turn tanks into Swiss cheese. Um, we saw that. So, uh, we'll talk about that more uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, additionally, you know, what was our uh, kind of main bomber we've been using in the 1950s, 60s, 70s? Okay, uh, it was a great bomber. Uh, obviously, though, it was at that point 30 years old by, you know, 1980 approximately. So, we saw the need for a, uh, a new bomber. So, we acquired the B-1 Lancer, which you see there. Uh, still in extensive use today. Um, kind of nice thing about the B-1, it kind of had more kind of fighter jet kind of characteristics about it. Um, using it, uh, had been using it very extensively in uh, in Afghanistan because we could basically have a couple of these kind of orbiting, carrying a lot of munitions and it get anywhere in the country uh, within a matter of, you know, a half hour just by having a few of them. Okay, and then just a couple other uh, couple other weapon systems. The uh, the AWACS, which you see here, which is basically a, uh, an outfitted Boeing 707 aircraft. Anybody know what the AWACS primary mission is? The E3 Century. Okay, very good. So it's a big ugly airplane with this dish that just kind of sits there spinning in flight. Uh, but in the back are a bunch of people looking at that, uh, basically at that radar feed. Uh, it helps us identify where uh, where friendly forces are um, in the air, but also where enemy uh, aircraft are or unknown aircraft are. So um, it's uh, still in service today. Anybody who wants to get stationed in Oklahoma for a good chunk of your career. That might be a good airframe for you to look into. And then uh, <clears throat> last uh, major weapon system, we're going to talk a, a few more here, though. Um, but these were kind of the ones really primarily um, 1970s that were coming into development. It was the Peacekeeper missile. This was uh, part of our intercontinental ballistic missile fleet. Um, and this was to uh, replace uh, the Minuteman missiles. Um, what made this one unique was... Uh, basically, it still worked like any other intercontinental ballistic missile, still shot up in basically the edge outer space uh, and would re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Only difference between that, though, and the Minuteman, Minuteman would sit, send it up, it would come back down, you know, feasibly Russia or wherever we were trying to attack. This one could go up in outer space and then release 10 separate warheads that could come down at 10 different targets. So, um, pretty crazy, awful stuff. Um, 
but that's basically the one we're still using um, today. Yes. When you said acquired facilities, what do you mean? Uh, Air Force purchased from um, companies like Lockheed or Northrop Grumman. Um, it, the acquisition process is a very long process. Like it can take ten or twenty years for us to be working with uh, engineers from these different companies to for them to basically develop and field and test. Uh, like a new weapon system. So, uh, like the F-22 Raptor, which became operational in 2007, um, they started designing that like in the late 1980s. So it's kind of like a constant process. Um, yes, we can sometimes buy just-in-time weapons, the weapon systems that they can develop in, a, you know, in a shorter period of time. But um, really, just the way a lot of laws work about how we, how we pay for stuff, congressional oversight, things like that. Uh, it's it's kind of a long, drawn out process. Okay, uh, a few more, and these kind of uh, kind of more again 1980s development for a lot of uh, for a lot of these 1980s even 1990s. Um, so I kind of the need for stealth aircraft, um, really after the uh, after the Vietnam War, uh, but really as technology was able to kind of support. Support having stealth aircraft. So, first one is the uh, F-117 Nighthawk, which you see here. We're going to talk about that a lot more with uh, with Desert Storm, uh, as well as the B-2 Spirit. So this was primarily a, a fighter aircraft. Really ended up being used more in an air to ground role. Um, and then the B-2 Spirit, which is kind of the, the more or less the backbone of our strategic fleet now. So. Uh, nuclear capable bomber, so we can uh, we can load that up with nukes if we ever had to uh, <coughs> had to deliver those. Uh, but also that state self capability um, with the B two Spirit is pretty uh, pretty crazy. So essentially, what the B two Spirit does, we can forward deploy it. We don't usually do it when it flies combat sorties. They may know where it flies them from. Yep, from Missouri. So that's where we got them stationed. Literally. Um, we used it on a few uh, strikes in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. Literally, they would just take off from Missouri, fly around the world, obviously getting refueled along the way, um, and then drop bombs and then come home. Grab McDonald's on the way home. Is that just to protect the <coughs> veterans? Do you take the base out of the U.S. instead of sending them over? Yeah, they're, um, they're very maintenance intensive. Um, and facility wise, uh, I've been to Whiteman um, once and literally they have like a hangar for everyone. So the same guy that works in the same hangar um, every night. And they're huge, so these hangars are huge, flight line. We only have like 20 of these things. Uh, I think they're about $2 billion a piece. So mm -hmm. just crazy cost. Like, how's that control? Like, yeah, it's like, it's so different than like, both, the, uh, both the Nighthawk and the Spirit. I guess like like made that way where people are like just wise just don't tip over this um stick aircraft. Yeah, they um the B two was actually kind of a design we kinda of, it wasn't entirely based. The German uh Germany during World War Two had basically a, a fixed wing bomber that kinda of looked like this. It was propeller driven. We kinda of took the uh designs from that. They actually have these this kind of rudder stabilizer thing in the back. It's like a little tail that kinda of goes up and down. Pretty crazy stuff. I, I'm not an engineer, so that's why I make motion like this. <laughs> um, but uh, stealth is also kind of in the shape and design and all sorts of stuff with the, the angles and um, the way radar kind of bounces off of the different angles and plates, uh, as well as the radar absorber material that they make out of. Uh, we also started modernizing our uh, cargo fleet, so. May know what aircraft that is? C-17. Okay, who flew the C-17? Very good. So that kind of replaced a lot of our uh, aging cargo aircraft that had, you know, taken on through the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Really kind of came online in the uh, 1990s, uh, primarily. And actually, we could fit uh, an Abrams tank, so that the Army's mainstay tank. We could fit uh, one of those in there. Uh, as well as a number of groups, so uh, kind of that took us going forward. So to complement, uh, we talked about the AWACS 
you know, the one with the spinning satellite dish on top. We also have what's called the joint stars. Um, and that was basically kind of the ground complement to uh, the AWACS. So basically how the AWACS helps us see everything going on in the air war, J-STARS flies around and kind of has uh, downward looking radar uh, and surveillance to look at the uh, what's going on on the ground, where our enemy troops are moving, where are their vehicles and things. <clears throat> and then kind of 1980s, 1990s, we really started testing the, uh, the new advanced fighter. Basically, the F-22 was designed to replace the F-117 as well as uh, the F-15 uh, Eagle. Uh, that's kind of our newest, uh, baddest fighter aircraft. Um, and then the F-35 kind of on the front line too. Just out of curiosity, how big is the F-117? Say, F-16 or F-22? It's kind of in between. <coughs> F-15, F-22 are substantially larger than an F. Uh, 16, hence the cost now, but also the size makes it more maneuverable, more powerful, capable of higher speeds. So it's kind of a uh, kind of an in-between uh, size there. So any questions on these? Don't get too uh, too uh, caught up on these. Um, you know, there, there'll be a question or two on the test. But just kind of be like, you know, broadly speaking, you know, we kind of wish these were some fighter, you know. Which these might have been a fighter aircraft developed back in the Vietnam War. Yes. Well, in the video, it talked about uh, like the uh, F-16 being like a joint project internationally, mm -hmm. project sort of deal. So what is that? So basically, um, countries we're allied with, um, we have a program called Foreign Military Sales, where basically we make it legal to sell certain weapon systems to other countries, allied countries. So, uh, for example, nowadays the F-35. Been in the news a lot. We have uh, several allies purchasing those alongside us, uh, namely Great Britain, uh, Australia, I want to say Italy was on the contract, uh, Japan. Uh, so it kind of can help with the development costs too to get other countries in uh, on that as well. And actually, the uh, F 16 um, factory is basically still open. We still sell them to, uh, to our allies. So the, uh, in the airstrikes against ISIS, uh, Jordan uh, actually is using F-16 aircraft that they purchased from us. So uh, we still sell them to the countries like uh, like Japan for their uh, self-defense force. But don't uh, countries just take that and then sell themselves? You know, take the fall. They they take could the um, feasibly, but it's it's a lot cheaper for them than building their kind of the, building their own factory and reverse engineering everything. Um, that's kind of why we don't sell some of that technology. Like the F-22, um, it's like a, it's a it's a law in the United States that we will not sell that to another country. Was the F-18 one of those? Yes, I believe we did sell the F-18 to some other uh, allies. So okay. we won't give them kind of the the best of the best. If that makes sense, just well, I mean, in it case. still gives you the idea. Yeah. So, um, but uh, basically, there are certain weapon systems that we will sell. Again, we're kind of picky and choosy with that stuff. Um, and even, you know, countries that we've helped out militarily, like Iraq, um, we, we did actually pull out a lot of, you know, we let them have some weapons, but we also took a lot of our leftover stuff with us when we left in fear that if we were to fall into enemy hands. So, yes? What does the EMEA stand for? Uh, electronic, okay. which is broadly speaking E. So that's uh, hard to the radar? Yep, exactly. Um, we have a C-130 cargo aircraft uh, designated as DC-130, and they have electronic jamming radar capability, um, things like that. So, good question. That was yeah, my you, question, Elsa. It's like you finish each other's sentences. <laughs> All right. Good question. Any other questions on any of this? A lot of, pretty much all these aircraft we talked about, they're all still in use today. Uh, some of them actually kind of getting closer to getting phased out, but still all in use. Okay, so <clears throat> quickly we're going to run through a couple military operations in the 1980s. Uh, the first one is uh, Grenada, where we <clears throat> where we uh, invaded Grenada with uh, with uh, the pursuit of Operation Urgent Fury. So a little background information: Grenada is a small island in the Caribbean. 
1979, his government took a Marxist turn, and Grenada became a dependent of the Soviet Union and Cuban aid, and the Grenadians seemed to be determined to enlarge their own armed forces. Uh, relations with other islands in the Caribbean, uh, as well as the United States worsened. A couple of years later, in 1983, the Prime Minister was killed in a bloody coup, and Grenada's neighbors were fearful that violence would spread uh, you know, to their islands and ask the United States for assistance. So, the United States uh, began operations on 25 October 1983 with the, <coughs> the objectives you see up there. First one was kind of the primary objective of the United States. We had a bunch of medical students down there. Uh, and we just wanted to safeguard uh, medical students. Uh, fear was that these uh, these communist forces, um, you know, amidst this bloody coup, uh, would uh, would go after our citizens. Uh, we we're also going to neutralize the hostile Grenadian forces uh, and restore the legitimate government. So this was a joint operation with the uh, United States Air Force and the Army. Uh, primarily, we were supporting uh, U.S. Army Rangers and elements of the 82nd Airborne Division. So overall, it was a it was a successful operation. The United States citizens were rescued, uh, and the coup elements were crushed, and order was restored. Um, we did suffer, however, uh, 19 uh, American casualties. Uh, a large number of those were actually due to uh, communication difficulties between between the services. So in essence, um, it's kind of the major uh, lesson learned here is we got to be speaking the same language as the Army, the Navy, Marines. Uh, basically, uh, we had several forces killed in what we call friendly fire. That's you know using our own weapons, bombs uh, against our own uh, troops, not in, not in, not intentionally, but inadvertently. Um, so we called in some airstrikes, uh, the way we called in coordinates versus the Navy and the Army, uh, we called them in differently, and uh, uh, ordnance basically hit, hit our own troops. Uh, we also learned that uh, overwhelming force is key to victory, so very much uh, different from Operation Rolling Thunder. Remember, graduate response did not work, so we have learned the lesson and apply it uh, to Grenada. Yeah, you bet. I'll also be posting these slides uh, today to our AEW for y'all. This also led to uh, an act of Congress called the uh, Goldwater Nichols Act, um, which basically uh, helped force kind of a unified command of, uh, of forces um, in any sort of deployed or um, contingency operation. So basically that would put um, a general officer from one of the services in charge of, uh, of the operation and it kind of forced them to have you know that air officer, that naval officer, um, and that ground officer on their staff. Of course, you oh, now you're calling me out for not listening to the pod. I think it was. I was listening. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, overwhelming force. Uh, we got to coordinate better with uh, with our sister services. Okay, moving forward, we're going to talk about Libya, another conflict we uh, we found ourselves in in the 1980s, 1986 to be exact. So uh, Operation El Dorado Canyon was the raid on Libya. So a little background information. Muammar Gaddafi, uh, who was in power until 2011. Anybody know what happened in 2011? The um, Arab the Arab Spring? Yep. Mm -hmm. So basically kind of uh, people rose up and said, we don't like you anymore. Uh, rebel forces took over. Um, and with basically with the, uh, with the support of... Um, U.S. aircraft. We, we enforced the no-fly zone, so Gaddafi could not uh, <clears throat> bomb his own people. But that's another story for another day. 
But uh, in the 1980s, Libyan leader Muammar al-Qaddafi had long been suspected of supporting international terrorism and terrorist groups. Um, Libya had had several brushes with U.S. forces during the years prior to 1986. Earlier that year, Libya was linked to the bombing of a nightclub in Berlin, Germany, uh, that had been frequented by U.S. Uh, military personnel. Uh, in addition, um, they had made public statements of support for uh, a couple terrorist acts that happened at airports in uh, both Rome and in uh, Vienna. Um, essentially, they were supporting kind of terrorism worldwide. Uh, so after the, uh, the nightclub bombing, uh, where three were killed, the United States uh, government decided to use Air Force F-111s flying from uh, Lake and, our Royal Air Force Base, Lake and Heath, basically uh, one of our bases in the United Kingdom. Um, along with U.S. Navy Marine aircraft flying from carriers in the Mediterranean to hit Libyan targets in April 1986. Uh, essentially, we went after uh, many, just basically some of their military strongholds. Uh, very successful operation. We did lose one Air Force uh, F-111. Both the, uh, the pilot and the navigator were killed. But uh, what kind of makes this interesting, and this is kind of one of your samples of behavior, let me kick the podium, um, was uh, France was actually kind of not on our side in this operation. They weren't against us, they just said, we're not going to support you flying your aircraft um, from Great Britain over France into Libya. So we had to go around. That's a really long way. So how do we get those aircraft all the way? the United Kingdom, down to Libya and back. Any guesses? Very good. So this was a major win for air-to-air -air refueling. Wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. Might be a question. Oh, my God. Okay, and just kind of a few lessons learned. Obviously, we had uh, we gotten better at the joint coordination. We we hit targets um, kind of in sync with Navy Marines, um, and kind of these uh, these bottom two points. You know, when pushed, we will strike out against uh, terrorist groups. This is kind of really the first time uh, terrorism really kind of saw a big uh, an almost a birth of sorts, kind of in the uh, late seventies, early eighties. Uh, this is kind of the U.S.'s first kind of standoff. Uh, against the country that uh, was supporting terrorism. Uh, so not only uh, did it prove that we had the capability to strike targets, um, but also that we had the, uh, the will to strike out to those targets. Yes? So what was the reason behind uh, the terrorists um, targeting the U.S. at the time? Uh, at the time, it was... <laughs> Um, it was uh, more or less the uh, alliances. Uh, it was kind of, not necessarily they weren't targeting U.S. Uh, in the United States soil, I guess, uh, per se. But um, it was kind of uh, outlashing at European powers, uh, as well as we had a lot of military bases in Europe at the time. So a pretty big uh, military presence, a lot of U.S. service members in Europe. Um, basically, our support for Israel, which is kind of the same theme we've been seeing for about 40 years now. Uh, U.S. support for Israel. That was kind of their the main uh, the main rationale. Uh, obviously, this was after uh, several conflicts between uh, Israel and uh, its uh, Arab neighbors. Okay, and last conflict we're going to talk about uh, quickly is Operation Just Cause, which was uh, the U.S. invasion of Panama. Which, uh, occurred in 1989. So a little background, Panamanian uh, General Manuel Noriega was in command of the country through control of the Panamanian Defense Forces, basically the Panamanian military, uh, as well as his political cronies. He had been a former ally of the United States, um, however he had been indicted by a grand jury in uh, Miami, Florida for alleged drug trafficking. So basically seeking revenge for this indictment, um, he wanted to boost his ego. Noriega began, began a campaign to discredit the United States in Panama. 
And we had, at this time, we had a number of military uh, bases in Panama helping oversee the uh, Panama Canal. So, uh, forces in the canal zone were being harassed and several physical confrontations, um, threats, beatings, uh, and the such took place between Panamanian Defense Forces and U.S. servicemen. <coughs> Noriega made implied threats to the security of the Panama Canal, uh, taunted the U.S. government, and tried to embarrass the United States in Latin America. And kind of the tip of the iceberg was uh, in an incident with the Panamanian Defense Forces, uh, a young uh, United States Marine uh, officer was killed in an incident. So in turn, uh, President George H.W. Bush uh, ordered Operation Just Cause. And uh, you see the uh, our main uh, goals up there. Obviously, remove Noriega from power, uh, safeguard the Panama Canal. Obviously, a lot of economic interests at stake for the whole world uh, by safeguarding the Panama Canal and restoring the democratic government that Noriega uh, had not allowed to take office. Basically, he had, uh, in essence, basically blocked legitimate government from taking power by using the Panamanian military. So we, uh, we, we not only supported ground troops by uh, a, airdropping airborne troops in, um, but we used uh, AC-130 gunships. So remember gunships, just big propeller, slow-driven aircraft with cannons. Uh, mini guns, things like that on there uh, to provide air cover for troops moving at night. Um, and another one of your examples of behavior, the uh, F-117 Nighthawk, remember that stealth fighter aircraft made its combat debut, uh, taking out a couple of uh, Panamanian uh, military sites. So essentially, uh, within six hours of the conflict, uh, the Panamanian Defense Force was neutralized, so major military operations were done um, at that point. Uh, some of Noriega's inner, uh, inner home guards, his inner kind of defense, they lasted uh, a little bit longer, uh, but eventually Noriega surrendered, basically sought refuge in the embassy, um, the, actually the Vatican, Vatican City's embassy in Panama, uh, and surrendered to U.S. law enforcement law enforcement officers in 30 January 1990. Now what's kind of cool is actually an Air Force C-130 actually transported him to the United States so he could face trial. Spent about 20 years in the U.S. Uh, in US prisons, uh, was then extradited to France, and I can't remember the third country, yeah, but finally was kind of freed in 2011. He's actually back in Panama now. Yes? So why was he picking fights with the U.S.? Uh, personal opinion, I think that's kind of irrational of him. Just, okay, so he was being dumb. Yeah, he was kind of being dumb. I think he thought um, he could kind of broaden his power base, and I think he thought, in essence, the United States wasn't going to do anything. Okay. So. Uh, and then just a couple quick lessons learned. Again, striking with overwhelming force. That's the big one you need to really, uh, really know. Again, striking with uh, overwhelming force uh, and our joint coordination. That approved. So real quick, obviously uh, midterm exam next week. Uh, big thing, multiple choice, true, false. I'm not going to have you do any fill in the blank, anything like that. Um, focus on your samples of behavior. Obviously very heavy focus on Vietnam. So you could uh, expect, you know, Gulf of Tonkin can expect a question or two about that. Uh, how air power was used in Southeast Asia. Remember we talked about interdiction, close air support airlift, search and rescue, kind of all these different facets of the air war, um, as well as kind of how our role evolved from, um, you know, the build-up years of the war to, uh, to Vietnamization, kind of what was our role during Vietnamization, everything like that. Uh, Rolling Thunder, linebacker one, linebacker two, we spent a lot of time talking about those three operations to just kind of know, you know, what was our plan, what went well, if anything went well, what didn't go so well, restrictions uh, or lack thereof um, on our aircraft and our pilots. Okay, talked uh, some lessons learned, um, and then just kind of just hone in on the uh, specifics from these 1980s campaigns. Yes? 
So the midterm's going to have to to here. To here. Nothing more. So uh, syllabus, I know, originally said for Golf War. We did not get that far, and that was due to the guest speaker, which hopefully we all got some good stuff out of it. Yes. Is that going to be the full 50 minutes? Uh, most people usually finish a little early, so if you finish early, you can go. Okay. But usually, they go about 30 minutes or so. Some people take longer than others. Any other questions? If you have any questions, I'll answer. You know, shoot me an email. Uh, I'll answer to the best of my ability without giving you answers. Anything else? Thanks for staying around. Sorry, the video didn't